a pair, Johan Aru and Aaron Power. Johan will start. Uh, he's a prof uh, he's a professor in uh, in Lausanne in EPFL, EPFL, and uh, he has been doing amazing work in the Gaussian free field stories and two and uh, two dimensional conformal geometry, conformal invariant geometry. And uh, he will talk about the char characterization theorems around the Gaussian free field. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for this uh, kind words of value. Uh, um, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. As you see, the, the, the title has changed a little bit uh, compared to what, uh, what we had on the web page. We, uh, had this uh, grand plan in the beginning to, uh, to talk about all kinds of uh, characterization theorems in random geometry, a uh, grand plan to, to capture our mind, but we uh, understood that the plan was uh, too big and maybe uh, not too friendly. And uh, so uh, uh, we changed our plans. It is uh, possible to stay flexible and change plans. So in this first half, I will uh, try to uh, contextualize the, the main result, uh, small characterization theorem uh, of, uh, of the Gaussian free field. And then in the second half, uh, Ellen will actually uh, get to the, to the thing and, uh, and present you the proof. So I will uh, somehow uh, show you the dishes and uh, you get to eat uh, in, the, in the second half. Um, okay, so what, what are characterization theorems? Uh, uh, a colleague of mine in the department told me that, okay, well, I was telling him about uh, that I like uh, characterization theorems in, in random geometry, etc. And told me, isn't, uh, isn't this uh, all done long ago? And uh, in some sense, uh, he was correct that uh, in the 70s, there was a surge of uh, characterization theorems coming more from uh, um, statistics uh, side of probability. Um, and uh, I thought that I will uh, just uh, quote uh, one of these uh, old statements about uh, characterization theorems. In the, so what they are about, for me, it's uh, uh, about finding uh, nice descriptions of uh, probability laws. They might be probability laws and just uh, simple R-valued random variables or, or random vectors or, or geometric random variables and, and characterization theorems that uh, help you uh, connect different objects, help you study them, uh, etc. And here uh, I would agree uh, with these three authors almost. Uh, uh, I would just uh, change um, one word for also probability. And this, uh, this uh, fun book uh, contains actually lots of characterizations of, of the Gaussian law, gamma law, discrete laws, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, contexts uh, why it might be uh, useful. Uh, in particular, just to, to start somewhere, the uh, Gaussian law that we all know is just a uh, normal random variable has uh, many, many uh, characterizations. Uh, uh, many of them which, uh, which uh, open uh, up uh, its uh, character and, and, and explain its uh, omnipresence. So for example, it's the maximum entropy distribution of uh, fixed mean and variance on R. There is the stability property. You can um, describe it by uh, uh, saying that if you have uh, free random variables that uh, satisfy some uh, uh, invariance in law by, by, by summing and dividing by square root of two, this has to be Gaussian. You have the famous uh, Stein's equation, uh, a, a result that I have actually had to use recently about, uh, which, I, which I find fun, that if you have two independent random variables and you know uh, independence of uh, certain linear forms of them, then uh, this is only also possible when you when you have uh, Gaussians, or uh, uh, a one uh, uh, quite uh, useful maybe in statistics that uh, if you have uh, independent random variables and, and you also know that their sample mean and variance are independent, you again uh, get uh, Gaussians. So there is actually a, a whole book about this uh, uh, Gaussian characterizations. Another book uh, again from the from the seventies showing uh, that this uh, at least once was, was a popular um, topic. Um, maybe a word on why, uh, why uh, I like these characterizations and why, why they could be uh, useful. And uh, well, if you look at uh, merely just this uh, Gaussian characterizations, then almost uh, each of them gives you uh, a different way, for example, of uh, looking at the uh, uh, central limit theorem. 
So for example, from the viewpoint of entropy, you can prove the central limit theorem, it's a technical proof, but uh, you can uh, argue that um, uh, the entropy of the partial sums of sum of xi over square root of n for iid uh, random variables will increase. And then uh, you can argue that what it increases to in the end uh, will be a maximum entropy uh, distribution and, uh, and actually um, uh, obtain uh, uh, the CLT this way. Or if you look at the stability wise, if you uh, assume that you have a, a limit in law, then by uh, singling out, for example, all terms and even terms in the sum, you also get this uh, equation of uh, uh, x plus y over square root of two uh, equal in uh, law to, uh, to itself. And uh, so these are, they give you uh, some reasons and, and, and inspire proofs for, uh, for looking at the um, central limit theorem. Uh, they also relate uh, kind of uh, uh, the um, uh, cautions to maybe real life situations or applications, uh, CLT itself already, uh, but uh, there is this uh, so-called Maxwell characterization as well, where you look at a vector, a random vector in Rn, say, and uh, you ask it uh, um, to have uh, IID uh, 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 marginals and to be a rotationary invariant. And this actually also characterizes um, uh, the standard caution for you. Okay, uh, it, uh, characterization laws uh, give you connections. Uh, if you look at this uh, stability criteria, then uh, you see that, okay, I could uh, change the square root of two and uh, you get the whole family of uh, different laws uh, related to the caution laws, stable laws, or you can go uh, look for uh, maximum entropy distributions and see what, uh, what are their uh, specific properties. And finally, and, and, and maybe uh, uh, for me, may, most importantly, it really explains why uh, you uh, see cautions. It explains uh, uh, universality uh, and uh, it helps to also, uh, some of these characterizations uh, help you to prove uh, CLT in, uh, in wider context of, uh, of not uh, purely uh, independent uh, random variables, for example. Similarly, you can start uh, characterizing uh, slightly more uh, complicated random objects. For example, uh, uh, let's look at uh, one dimensional uh, Brownian motion. So this is also um, relatively uh, standard. Uh, instead of uh, giving uh, density for uh, finite dimensional marginals, you could, uh, of course, uh, as every Gaussian process, you could uh, describe it by giving its uh, mean and covariance. So look at it as a centered Gaussian process whose covariance is given by, uh, by, by the Green's function of the Laplacian, um, which uh, here would be, um, if you have uh, one, uh, one, one boundary at uh, zero, just uh, the minimum of uh, times S and T. Uh, but there are other uh, uh, characterizations that uh, uh, just go from uh, some statistical uh, invariance properties. For example, uh, it uh, brown in motion uh, up, to, uh, up to a drift is the, only continuous stochastic process with uh, independent uh, stationary increments. Or uh, there is the famous uh, Levy characterization where uh, um, uh, it, uh, you, you, you look at it as the uh, continuous martingale uh, so that uh, uh, you uh, um, also have a criterion on, on the quadratic uh, variation. Or there's another more functional analytic point of view where you look at it as a standard Gaussian on a certain uh, functional space, the, um, the space of uh, uh, all functions whose uh, L2 norm of gradient is, uh, is finite and, and, and with this um, um, uh, gradient norm. Or you describe it uh, very um, relatedly uh, using a Fourier series, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, these different characterizations uh, give you uh, different uh, reasons uh, for being of, of, of uh, Brownian motion and, uh, and uh, help you, uh, for example, prove uh, scaling limit results for uh, random walks or particle systems. For example, Martingale property is a nice property that uh, passes to the limit. So it's uh, something that is, uh, um, is uh, nice to use. Uh, or Fourier series help to connect uh, Brownian motion very nicely to the stochastic heat equation and identify it as the, as the stationary solution there, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are maybe the uh, very um, uh, basic results and uh, 
and I would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, come to some um, newer newer ones now. So the initial plan was to uh, tell you about um, uh, how to characterize all uh, these kinds of objects here on the slide. Uh, um, uh, this, as I said, was uh, too grand of a plan, uh, but I thought that I'll uh, still uh, put this um, panorama of, uh, of different uh, objects in random uh, geometry on, uh, on the slide. There are models of random surfaces, random curves, uh, uh, statistical physics models and their interfaces, um, some, some ink, a cloud, uh, things that uh, we can describe, things that we are wanting to describe and uh, that, uh, that we hope to describe um, one day. Um, in, uh, I would like to bring out one characterization in, in, in random theory, a, a real classic, and also say why I uh, consider it as a, as a classic among uh, characterization theorems. And this is uh, um, by now, uh, uh, of course, a very well-known uh, result on, uh, on the schramm lerner evolution, SLE. Um, and here I, uh, we talk about uh, probability measures on, uh, on random curves. So let, let's fix a domain, maybe the disk, and uh, look at um, um, continuous curves from one boundary point to the other. And, and, and we uh, look at, uh, consider probability measures on, uh, on this space. And, and we think of this uh, curve as, as a certain of exploration of the domain uh, by uh, someone who uh, uh, walks around. You are uh, in one uh, end of the forest. Your aim is go to the other end of the forest, and uh, and you uh, draw your uh, uh, your path uh, through it. So it's somehow a probability measure on on, on this path. And now we put uh, a uh, very uh, natural. Um, uh, or at least a probabilistically natural invariance condition on it. Uh, again, we ask it to have uh, stationary independent uh, increments. Okay, and what do I mean by this? So uh, suppose we've uh, discovered uh, um, our, our curve for up to time t, and then we discover it for another segment of uh, t. And then uh, the condition we want to put is uh, really like you, you have in uh, Brownian motion that uh, this uh, increment has the same law and uh, is independent of, uh, of the previous increment. Here, of course, uh, in the Brownian motion case, if you want to talk of the uh, increments, you will have to normalize them uh, back to zero. You're at certain height and you want to see how things uh, change from this height. And here we have to also take uh, into account the geometry of what we have uh, discovered uh, so far. So we actually uh, have to map back to the unit disk, look at this uh, new segment in the unit disk. And then uh, uh, there, uh, our claim makes sense. We can really uh, ask uh, these increments to uh, have the same law and, uh, and be uh, independent. And there is this uh, beautiful uh, characterization theorem by, by Ode Schramm, uh, uh, which says that uh, if you basically uh, take this uh, stationary independent increment condition on these uh, uh, curves, and you ask some other uh, small invariants, for example, reflection invariants with respect to the vertical axis or, uh, or uh, some uh, scaling uh, invariants, then uh, what you obtain is a, is a one parameter family uh, of uh, probability measures. There is a one uh, parameter family of, uh, of such uh, continuous processes that are called uh, uh, schramm lerner evolution, SLE um, kappa. And uh, this kappa somehow measures uh, uh, windiness. Uh, in the beginning, you have really a nice, uh, simple, uh, continuous curves. And as kappa grows, uh, the curves start uh, touching uh, um, uh, themselves. And, uh, and finally, you uh, start getting uh, some uh, space-filling uh, uh, monster, monster curves. For me, this is, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, an ideal uh, characterization theorem because uh, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it, it, it tells you that uh, uh, probability measures uh, on random curves, with, uh, you know, there are not so many with uh, natural uh, properties. Uh, it's easy to prove. It all comes down to uh, a characterization of, of, of a prominent motion. And on the other hand, it, it does give you uh, lots of uh, insight somehow. Uh, and by this uh, insight, I mean that it, uh, it uh, connects uh, uh, many uh, statistical physics models defined uh, on lattices. So uh, 
you have this uh, statistical physics models like percolation, easing model, self-avoiding walk that I'm not going to describe in detail, but uh, uh, if these models uh, have, they often have these uh, two phases, for example, percolation is, you know, you have a colored black and white and, and you have these interfaces uh, between the, uh, the phases. And uh, for several of these models, these uh, interfaces do satisfy uh, this uh, kind of uh, stationary um, independent increment condition in some sense, because the process, uh, if you have discovered the interface a little bit, will uh, 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 be still a discovery of the interface thereafter as well. Okay, and uh, in, in some sense, uh, with, uh, with the same law, you, you have to take into account the fact that you are uh, in a new domain, so really in the sense we uh, described before. And uh, for several of those, uh, convergence uh, towards SLE curves has uh, now been proved, for example, for percolation or easing model, for some still not, like self-avoiding walk, but it gives you a conceptual understanding uh, why uh, these uh, models are uh, connected, even if this uh, concrete uh, characterization theorem is not maybe the one you uh, uh, use for um, for proving the scaling uh, limit result. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Then I would um, develop um, to, uh, to uh, my uh, own favorite object. Uh, this is the Gaussian free field. Uh, I found I still have a picture of uh, that uh, Avelio has produced of, uh, of the free field. Uh, so um, it's a um, very beautiful picture. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to tell you about uh, what the, this object is and what, what, uh, how, how we can characterize um, this object. So in one dimension, the zero boundary Gaussian free field, in one dimension, it would be just on, uh, on an interval it would actually just be the Brownian bridge. It's nothing new, it's an object uh, that you already know. So let me give you a characterization uh, of the Brownian bridge uh, on, on, on this interval. Uh, and uh, what I say is that, okay, uh, I have um, hidden here a certain normalization. So there is a, a normalization constant uh, that you fix in some way. So up to a, a multiplicative constant, Brownian bridge is the only random continuous function on zero one that uh, satisfies a certain, um, uh, what I call a domain Markov property. So what is this uh, domain Markov property? It says that for any sub interval that I choose um, uh, inside this initial interval, uh, I have a, a decomposition of, uh, of the Brownian bridge. And uh, what is decom this decomposition? I have this uh, part uh, uh, phi and this phi, uh, um, gathers is, is equal just to my Brownian bridge outside of the interval. And inside it's uh, the a linear extension between uh, the two uh, endpoints. Okay, so there it's uh, this um, uh, part of um, uh, on the, on the um, image. And then the, the part in blue, this uh, P tilde is the one that adds you uh, the extra fluctuations inside this uh, interval I. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, this uh, p tilde is just uh, equal in law to uh, to b, and as you see uh, in the decomposition, I have then just uh, kind of uh, you know translated and scaled it in a, in a specific way. But it's uh, I'm just taking an independent copy of uh, of the original object, and uh, 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 I'm saying that this uh, is really independent of uh, of this phi uh, everything that is outside and the linear extension. And the claim is that if you can do this uh, for uh, every uh, interval, then uh, actually uh, the only possibility is that you have uh, a Brownian bridge, okay? So this uh, is, uh, I think, uh, uh, I hope you agree, uh, a uh, natural uh, uh, property to ask from a continuous uh, um, function zero one that uh, inside uh, you have uh, and uh, in the, in somehow like an independent stationary uh, increment, uh, and it really um, characterizes the Brownian bridge. So in higher dimensions, the Gaussian free field is a, is a generalization of this uh, uh, one-dimensional Brownian bridge. 
Uh, and the main result we, uh, you know, I, I, we want to present today is that uh, you can define the higher dimensional Gaussian free field by an analogous uh, characterization. Okay, so uh, stated uh, informally, the precise uh, statement with uh, some um, um, technical uh, conditions uh, uh, will come in the second half, but informally stated uh, on a d-dimensional ball, so, uh, you know, a d-dimensional um, interval, there is a, a unique Schwarz distribution. So it's not anymore a continuous function. We are large, we're in a larger setting of objects. There's a, a, a unique Schwarz distribution that uh, satisfies the domain Markov property uh, with an appropriate scaling, like in the 1D case. And uh, this is the object uh, that we call uh, the continuum uh, Gaussian uh, free field. Uh, maybe I should... Uh, be clear on uh, what is this uh, domain mark of property in, in, in higher dimensions. So uh, we look at this uh, random field on a, on, a, on a ball and domain mark of property will really be the equivalent of the one dimensional case. We take uh, some uh, small ball uh, inside and we say that uh, for each uh, such small ball, we can uh, uh, write the field we can uh, uh, as, a, as a sum. Again, there is a component that is uh, just equal to the field uh, outside of the smaller ball. And this, uh, what is it inside? We cannot anymore really take a linear extension. It wouldn't be natural in D dimension, especially in a ball, but uh, you can take a harmonic extension of the boundary values. Um, so we ask it to be uh, harmonic. And then uh, uh, we are kind of adding the fluctuations. We ask the other part uh, to be uh, equal in law to the initial field and uh, be then uh, properly rescaled. And finally, we ask that this uh, additional increment is uh, independent of uh, what you've seen uh, before. So uh, really a, a natural um, um, extension of uh, stationary uh, independent uh, increment. Okay, so let me still also uh, come to the um, classical definition of the free field because this will also clarify why uh, we had to go uh, to this uh, space of uh, Schwarz distributions, why we don't have uh, continuous functions. Um, and you will uh, see when I uh, go through these uh, classical definitions, why uh, I prefer to give you the characterizations because uh, the classical definition, you will need to work a little bit and the object looks uh, more technical than it actually is. It actually really is a, a, a field with uh, stationary independent increments. So the first, uh, Definition you would like to give if uh, you know I tell you that I'm going to uh, generalize uh, Brownian motion or Brownian bridge to higher dimension is maybe the following. I uh, look at the continuum GFF as a centered Gaussian process, and I give you the covariance, which by analogy with Brownian motion, I just uh, ask to be the Green's function of the Laplacian with the zero boundary conditions. Why I say it's an attempt of a, of, of a definition, why, why is there a problem, is, is the following. The thing is that the covariance, you can uh, calculate it and it blows up uh, at the diagonal. Okay, so in uh, two dimension, this blow up is uh, logarithmic and uh, in higher dimension, it's a uh, uh, power law uh, blow up. So in particular, if you would want to, uh, you see that you cannot really evaluate this uh, Gaussian uh, process at any point because uh, the variance would be just infinite. You uh, wouldn't uh, uh, have a value. And you see it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, defined point-wise. This is of course, uh, uh, you know, something uh, which uh, people know how to handle since, since a long time. Uh, generalized function is not uh, something new. If you cannot evaluate something at the point, uh, you uh, just uh, look for some uh, smoother averages. You uh, take average uh, of the field over some balls or circles or, uh, or uh, over some uh, smooth um, test functions. And then uh, this uh, uh, gives you uh, uh, a rigorous way to define your uh, Gaussian free field uh, on, on, on some domain. You still uh, define it as a, as a centered Gaussian process, but you just, instead of indexing it by points, you index it by, uh, for example, uh, a smooth, uh, compactly uh, supported functions on the domain. And then for each uh, pair of these functions, you uh, define the uh, covariance uh, still using um, the Green's uh, kernel. 
So if I go through uh, this definition, it's, uh, it's very nice. I have a stochastic uh, field or process type of definition. And then I can uh, uh, later uh, uh, see, as you would uh, do with Brownian motion, that it has uh, a version that uh, can be uh, uh, actually um, considered on, uh, on a certain analytical space. For example, you can uh, here take uh, any sovel of space of, uh, of, of negative index and, and, and consider the Gaussian free field uh, actually as a, uh, as a probability measure on, on, on that space as a, as a random object um, living there. Okay, so this uh, is a, a definition uh, you would uh, uh, um, uh, probably accept. Let me give you uh, uh, yet uh, another one. Uh, if your domain is nice uh, in any dimensions, I've done it here on the, on the square in two dimensions, uh, you can also ask for the Brownian breach or Brownian motion, just use the Fourier series. Okay, so uh, here I've uh, uh, written the uh, sign series because I somehow have a zero boundary conditions. And uh, the, the X and M are just uh, IID standard Gaussians. So here I have uh, taken some uh, finite uh, piece of this uh, Fourier series. And then I just like let uh, big N uh, to infinity, I will look at uh, higher or higher frequencies. And I uh, uh, consider uh, the convergence of these fields uh, in low and in uh, a suitable space. Uh, for example, it's quite easy uh, to, to handle it in, uh, in the sorbol of space of um, index uh, minus one. And this is uh, the way uh, you actually often use to uh, to simulate uh, the Gaussian free field, uh, you just simulate it by uh, the Fourier series. And here is, uh, I've forgotten, it's by uh, Janne Junila, these pictures where uh, you have uh, just uh, um, increased uh, the number of frequencies uh, you looked at. Okay, and you see that uh, it starts off, the Gaussian free field starts off as uh, something uh, rather smooth, just fluctuating. And soon enough, uh, it seems uh, just uh, like, uh, uh, like a, maybe a hedgehog or, uh, you know, but the hedgehog who also has uh, spikes uh, inside, the, inside the body. Yeah. Okay, so this is the Gaussian free field. Let me uh, tell you uh, some uh, other nice properties that are maybe not uh, uh, direct, uh, um, but, uh, but that appear. So, uh, it satisfies certain uh, geometric invariances like, uh, like uh, Brownian motion. So there is the scaling property. Okay, so this we somehow used in the characterization uh, that we gave, not uh, in the two definitions, but in the characterizations we had this uh, scaling property coded in. But in fact, it has more uh, uh, invariances. It has a, a, a rotational invariance uh, in all dimensions. Um, the, the, the law is invariant under uh, uh, rotating. Uh, or uh, in two dimensions, in fact, the invariance is, is, is larger. You have what is called conformal invariance. So uh, to push forward, and for example, under any Möbius Mac in the, in, in the disk uh, still gives you uh, uh, the law of, uh, of a Gaussian free field and, and allows you to define uh, the free field actually um, on, uh, on any simply connected uh, domain. Uh, what is, I think, interesting is that uh, uh, we only uh, used uh, in the characterization the, the first property. The second and the third one come for free, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, you didn't need to use these properties to, to, to characterize uh, the free field. A little bit similarly, like for Brownian motion, you know, the scaling uh, comes from free. You don't uh, need to put it uh, in the characterization. Or for SLE, for example, in the characterization, I don't actually need to put uh, uh, scale invariance. It, uh, it will come for free if I put, uh, if I put um, uh, reflection uh, invariance and uh, um, yeah. Okay, so this is something I, uh, I would like to uh, iterate again that this, uh, we just basically use this uh, domain uh, Markov property uh, and uh, we get uh, um, the characterization other geometric uh, invariances uh, follow. Um, and one reason why I emphasize this is that there was an earlier characterization also of the, of the continuum Gaussian free field. Uh, 
in uh, two dimensions, uh, actually very, very, very uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, paper by, by uh, Helen Nathanel and, and Gurup, uh, and uh, where they do it in two dimensions, but assuming uh, conformal invariance. Okay, so they also put in this uh, natural uh, um, invariance that you, you see in two dimensions and, and, and they characterize the Gaussian free field um, using that. So we were able to get rid of this conformal invariance and, and, and extend it to, uh, to other dimensions and conformal invariance will uh, somehow come just as a byproduct. I would also like to uh, here already um, uh, uh, mention it and, and, and maybe Ellen uh, explains it in, in, in more detail depending on what, what her uh, plan is uh, uh, exactly to say that uh, actually you can get uh, rid of this very exact domain Markov property in a way that for uh, Brownian motion, you have this um, characterization using stationary independent increments, but you have also a Martingel type of characterization where you uh, have a Martingel condition and then uh, something on a quadratic vari uh, uh, variation. And you can do uh, something similar here. You can replace this uh, very uh, rigid uh, condition, which I think uh, is aesthetically um, nice. You can, you can replace it by a more Martingale type of condition where you ask uh, the conditional expectation inside uh, any of these uh, um, smaller balls to be equal to the harmonic extension from the boundary. And then you add uh, some uh, uh, less uh, precise uh, condition on the field inside. You certainly don't want to ask anything uh, about independence, but uh, you ask something uh, which uh, guarantees you the, uh, uh, somehow the right uh, blow up, for example. Um, we haven't stated anything precisely in the paper on that because uh, I don't think we saw something, uh, you know, uh, very elegant. And then uh, it rather depends on uh, what uh, is the um, application you, uh, you have uh, in mind. But there are certainly um, several versions you, you, you could give. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to say, that, okay, uh, here everything uh, is stated uh, in a ball, but uh, you can uh, generalize into uh, more uh, general domains, uh, even surfaces like a torus of, uh, of higher genus without boundary and also something that are uh, called uh, general free fields. And uh, for, for some of them, uh, the, the, the very simple proof uh, we have will be hard to handle, but there is an uh, alternative uh, approach that, um, that allows to, allows to uh, generalize a bit, um, a bit more. Nevertheless, I think that, you know, I, 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 this characterization, I think it fits uh, some of the criteria, which I said, uh, you know, I, I would like to have uh, for, from a characterization theorem. One is uh, that it's uh, simple to state, the other it's uh, simple to prove. As you will see, uh, these somehow uh, do hold. I mean, in the simple of state, uh, I guess there are some uh, technical conditions we would still want to get rid of, but uh, I think uh, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, but uh, what it does not uh, still uh, do is it does not explain the whole, uh, uh, panorama of uh, scaling limit uh, results uh, related to the Gaussian free field. And I don't mean even that it uh, would need to, uh, you know, uh, give you the proofs, because uh, also with SLE, as I said, uh, if you actually prove a scaling limit result, you, you don't necessarily um, uh, prove it via this uh, characterization, but just that uh, it would explain uh, uh, these results, which uh, um, I will um, uh, list a little bit here. And uh, before listing them, uh, I, I just uh, want to put my sincere apologies on the table for not putting uh, any names here, because I started putting names and then I started putting more names and more names. And then I thought that I'm missing someone and I'm missing someone else. And, uh, and then uh, I, I thought that I will not be able to sleep and uh, being too worried that I left out someone important. So, so I went for the other way. I'm not sure it's good, but I, I, I just uh, decided not to, not to put names. There were uh, really there are lots of people who have worked on these interesting results, uh, seeing uh, GFF appear in, in different, con different contexts, for example, as uh, interface, uh, Ginsburg lando uh, interface models, as correctors in stochastic homogenization. In these cases, maybe uh, still our characterization does tell you a little bit why uh, you would expect the GFF to, uh, to appear because there are some uh, minimization problems there related to uh, uh, the uh, harmonic functions, etc. 
But already a little bit more difficult is the question of timers, on which there has been uh, lots of progress from, from uh, many people. Um, timer height functions. Uh, there are several other models, six vertex model, et cetera, uh, random current height functions that give, uh, give uh, um, scaling limit results uh, uh, as a scaling limit result, uh, the Gaussian free field. It's known that it's related to uh, the Brownian loop soup, uh, local times. Uh, moreover, the exponential of the Gaussian free field uh, uh, appears uh, as a Moulin form or related to the metric of random planar maps. It appears in random matrix theory, in uh, Ginebra ensemble, just the GFF uh, appears for eigenvalues. And there are many, many of these occurrences, which I don't think uh, we have uh, a good uh, understanding for. So the GFF is omnipresent, but, uh, but why? Uh, and, and maybe we just need uh, a few more of these characterization theorems, uh, especially uh, uh, without this um, uh, harmonicity condition that, uh, that makes our uh, proof uh, work. Uh, as I said, we can re relax the independent stationary copy, but not really the uh, uh, harmonic uh, uh, extension of, uh, of boundary values. Uh, in particular, I, I like advertising this uh, one uh, problem that to, to the best of my knowledge is open. Uh, if someone has solved it here, uh, please uh, to correct, uh, I'd be uh, happy to know. But it's uh, this very um, uh, natural approximation. So the most natural approximation maybe of the Brownian preach is that you uh, look at the uniform measure on all uh, height functions that differ by one minus one uh, over a, a, a tight uh, um, discretization of the interval. And uh, you know, uh, you, you see that this converges to the Brownian preach and the equivalent in uh, two dimensions, uh, for example, is, uh, is open. You consider the height functions uh, that differ by uh, one and uh, minus one over the edges with certain boundary conditions. If you uh, look them on a, on a, on a finite uh, lattice, uh, in the box, there are finitely many of them. You can put the uniform measure. You look at the uniform such a height function. And the conjecture is that this will actually just uh, converge to the um, uh, Gaussian free field. So you have to be careful because it's a very rigid to have this uh, plus minus one uh, changes. You have to be careful with, uh, with boundary conditions. But uh, this is uh, still something which I think many people are interested in, are getting partial results, but uh, that uh, hasn't um, been uh, proved uh, uh, just as yet. Um, okay, so now how am I doing with time? So, so I have it. So you have ten minutes left. Ten minutes. Okay, very good. Then uh, uh, this is kind of the preparation I needed for uh, the second part to put. Um, and to, uh, so that Ellen, Ellen can start off well. And now we're uh, still uh, in the spirit of talking about characterization theorems. I would like to talk about two characterization theorems inside the Gaussian free field or related to the Gaussian free field that tell you uh, uh, something um, interesting. So, so how we use this uh, technique of uh, characterization theorems. So no thank you yet, we'll, um, we'll go on. And the extra one is, uh, is a, you know, a, what might sound a naive question to start off with, how do you define a level lines of the Gaussian free field in two dimensions? You know that the field is not defined point-wise, so you cannot just define it by saying, uh, you know, I look at the set of uh, all points where the field is equal to zero, for example, equal to 10. So, uh, you know, can you do it? How do you do it? And here, a very beautiful answer given by um, Schramm and uh, Sheffield is that uh, you can do it and you can uh, do it uh, via characterization. And what you put into this characterization uh, uh, to cook it up is some geometric and some uh, probabilistic uh, properties. Okay, and uh, you see a proof uh, by picture, the level line is, uh, is uh, there and it uh, comes out to have uh, the law of SLE4. So let me try to explain you a little bit uh, how this uh, characterization works, just uh, uh, to see that uh, there is um, some new thoughts uh, 50 years for on. And look at uh, the, the, the one-dimensional case. Okay, so let us uh, look at uh, a Brownian motion and uh, look at the geometric set 
that is defined as follows. I look at uh, all points um, 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 in the uh, domain that are connected to zero by the uh, Brownian path. Uh, so the Brownian path remains in the interval minus AB. Okay, in, uh, so probabilistic terms, it would be the exit time of Brownian motion from uh, the interval minus AB. Okay, so the first uh, geometric characterization is exactly the set of points that is connected to zero via a path in which the uh, height of the Brownian motion is in this interval. But there is another uh, description of the, of the same interval, which uh, combines uh, a probabilistic and the and uh, geometric property. We can also define it as the smallest uh, random interval, so that if we uh, uh, condition on this uh, random interval and where it ends, then uh, what uh, remains to be discovered is an independent Brownian motion starting from either uh, uh, minus uh, A or B, depending on, on, on this uh, endpoint. Okay, so uh, um, here, uh, this is uh, uh, saying that uh, we look at the random set that satisfies uh, the strong Markov property and uh, with uh, a certain uh, uh, condition on its uh, endpoint. So the first description, as I said, will not uh, generalize to higher dimensions of the GFF because uh, things are not defined point-wise. We are uh, using information on point-wise uh, defined things. Whereas in the second characterization, I'm not using anything about the uh, uh, Brownian motion being uh, defined point-wise. And so you can uh, cook up uh, uh, a characterization of the say uh, zero level line, uh, because if you know, at least if you think uh, intuitively, if you know that the zero level line uh, exists, then what do you know? Well, uh, if you know that it starts at the point in the boundary, you can follow it uh, without discovering further away. You can just uh, follow your uh, contour line, like uh, in the mountains you're walking, you can uh, stay on the same height. And uh, so uh, you uh, assume it to satisfy a, a strong uh, Markov property. And moreover, naturally, you would uh, assume the boundary condition uh, just to be zero. Well, life is not as nice because uh, you have, uh, uh, because uh, this uh, um, non-pointwise uh, defined uh, function gives you a certain repulsion effect. So around your uh, level line on two sides, you will actually have a cap between the sides. So the boundaries values are not zero, but you can still define this uh, level line uh, exactly with this principle that it's uh, uh, just uh, a, uh, random set that uh, satisfies a stronger Markov property with certain boundary conditions. And in fact, you can uh, go um, uh, even further. Uh, you can uh, then uh, define uh, uh, different types of uh, geometric uh, sets of the Gaussian free field in the uh, same spirit. For example, the analogs of, uh, of these uh, exit times, uh, etc. And here, uh, I know uh, Avelio will be embarrassed, but uh, that's uh, things we have been uh, working on. And uh, just want to, that, uh, yeah, these are, I think, beautiful things. I'm happy about them. Uh, and um, as a second extra, I wanted to uh, 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 tell about other characterization result uh, for the uh, Gaussian free field, which is uh, the exponential of the free field. So here again, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a priori not clear how you uh, define um, the exponential uh, of the Gaussian free field because it's not defined uh, point-wise. So again, I consider it in, in two dimensions. But okay, it's not too difficult. Uh, you approximate it, for example, during uh, using these uh, Fourier approximations. So at each uh, finite level, you have a continuous function. You take uh, the exponential of that, you see that uh, its average will start blowing up, but then you normalize it to have a unit average and you take a limit and you see that you can uh, take this limit um, as a random measure. But here, if you do this, you uh, run into a question, uh, an actual question, which is uh, why uh, you, know, you, you did something arbitrary. You could have used many, many different uh, approximations, not only the Fourier approximation, and why would you get uh, a uh, unique uh, answer? 
Why is there a uniquely uh, well-defined uh, object as the exponential of the free field? And this was something which uh, people thought about quite a lot. There were different uh, uh, strategies how to explain this universality, why different approximations give you the same result. And uh, although, uh, you know, uh, there were many approaches, I think really uh, there was one result which uh, somehow uh, solved it. It doesn't, it didn't solve it in the way that it would uh, unify all different approximations, but it pretty much gave, uh, at least to my mind, an, a, a, a satisfactory answer. And this was a, a, a very acute observation by, by Shamov that you can uh, define uh, or you can characterize the exponential of the free field a little bit like you uh, characterize the uh, exponential uh, function itself using a, a functional equation. Okay, and here the functional equation is that if uh, you add uh, some function, it uh, comes out as an exponential of, um, of that function in, in, in uh, front of the measure. And this uh, very simple idea, in fact, has been now uh, uh, pushed uh, much further. Uh, and uh, there is a, a very beautiful characterization of uh, metrics related to the uh, Gaussian free field where you uh, really uh, uh, don't uh, just look at um, locally uh, exponential and the volume, but you try to measure uh, uh, the distance of paths using this exponential of the, of the GFF. And this is really a, a break, breakthrough work by, by Ding and the Queen and, and Miller. Okay, so I hope these were uh, two little uh, examples of uh, how uh, characterization theorems are now used in the uh, 21st century. And, uh, and uh, I will, uh, I will uh, thank you for your attention and uh, please uh, stay tuned for, for the real stuff as well, where uh, you, you actually get to uh, taste some math. Uh, thank you very much, Johan. Are there any questions? So, before. I think there are questions from the audience. Ah, yes. So, if you have questions, you can just unmute yourself or write it on the chat. Unmuting yourself is better. Uh, while we wait a little bit, I, I, had, I had one, which is maybe a little bit mean. So I was uh, thinking that uh, about these uh, Brownian motion stories mm -hmm. and uh, one nice story about, uh, let's say, a little bit more general, continuous martingales. Uh, they are just a change of time of, of Brownian motion. No? Yeah. So I was thinking uh, if you have a certain similar thing, so the, the, the statement is the following. Imagine that you condition, let's say, outside the circle, and uh, what you see in your law is generally something which is harmonic, if, if I understand correctly. But here you are just asking that the mean on the middle is uh, obtained as, as a certain mean of the object. Yes? Like, like, mm -hmm. so like, like a martingale but you don't ask that, that it's harmonic in a certain sense. Is this just like a change of time? Uh, if, if it's a change of space of the uh, GFF, but maybe not by a harmonic function, but by a, how, how to say, by a conformal invariant uh, transformation, but just by, let's say, a B continuous transformation. Oh. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a uh, good question, but what would be the, uh good uh, way to uh, to state this kind of more uh, general one I, you as you say you would expect there to be some uh, family of uh, like this uh, time changed uh, uh, caution free fields uh, um, what, what did you uh, propose you proposed you uh, I wanted some kind somehow like a certain uh, mean it, it, it is a mean that you obtain looking at the boundary. Yeah, so, so let me give you something which uh, I think is related, but I think it's open. Uh, at least uh, in Ellen we discussed, we don't know how to do it. Uh, I think this uh, question goes uh, back to uh, Sheffield. It's, uh, you will see it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun and it's related to what you ask is that suppose you around each point, if you look at the circle average process from the biggest circle uh, uh, onwards, you know that it's a Brownian motion. Do you know uh, if it's a uh, Gaussian free field? Uh, we haven't thought too much about it, but uh, it doesn't follow uh, directly from, uh, from.
from what we have. And there, you know, uh, you're kind of only asking about this uh, middle point, right? Uh, yes. uh, in, in, in some sense. And so uh, um, it's uh, certainly true that uh, if you don't ask it up to the, the largest circle, you uh, can uh, um, uh, mess up. So for example, if you ask that at each point, there is some uh, uh, radius starting from which you have a Brownian motion, then uh, you can uh, add some correlation. You can, uh, and uh, you don't have to have a free field. But for example, this is a, a question and there, uh, you know, later on you could uh, stay, ask what happens if you uh, kind of don't ask it to be exactly a Brownian motion, but, uh, uh, you see that there is some kind of uh, funky consistency that has to come from all points and uh, that is not so easy to, uh, to, to handle. Yeah, so, so I think, I guess if you maybe the types of process that Avelio is talking about should be what you get if you impose that condition, um, if you impose that you have just a continuous martingale when you look at the circle averages around all points. Yes, so it's clear that at each point you can, you know, play around, but uh, well, it's also, for me, it's already not clear what would be uh, the consistent condition you can put around all points that uh, you would have a non-trivial. Uh, right, I mean, one would, yeah, uh, I, I, I agree. I'm just, um, but maybe that's a kind of natural notion of a time change of the, the Gaussian yeah. free field is, you know, where each of these circle average processes, it goes from being a Brownian motion to being some time change Brownian motion. Um, yeah. so you but can, it's not clear what type of objects you would have because even if you ask them all to be Brownian motions, it's not in really clear that you would still get a Gaussian free field. Yeah, but uh, I mean, probably this, uh, well, you, you, of course you can go, you can, you know, you just uh, uh, change your metric uh, conformal at each point, you change the, uh, gradient uh, so that the size of the gradient changes at each point and it should, uh, it will still give you a Gaussian process and probably you are just uh, somehow changing these uh, times, but uh, you know, what would be the natural condition uh, that gives you all this family? I, 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 would, I wouldn't know. Thank you. Are there any other questions? May I ask a short one? Yes, of course. Yes, please. You basically two questions. Firstly, you showed in the middle um, how to transform the domain Markov property into a martingale type property. As domain Markov property, I think is quite a general um, um, uh, con condition in scaling limits. Could this be generalized? Also to other problems of scaling limits outside of the GFF. Mm. Well, I think, uh, uh, for example, in the SLE case, if you actually prove uh, scaling limits, you also don't prove uh, such a statement uh, that uh, are used here for the characterization that you have. Uh, independent stationary increments. You, you rather do a proof uh, via martingales. You, uh, you prove uh, kind of that uh, there are, you find uh, two martingales and using this, uh, you characterize that you have a SLE. So, so I would say that in some sense, there is uh, some uh, martingale uh, type of condition behind the uh, SLE as well when you prove uh, scaling limits. Okay, thanks. And just a very short second mm -hmm. one. Um, in general, um, uh, uh, um, I'm a little bit lost. So uh, 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 Brownian motions are usually uh, in high dimensions. They have different definitions. D does uh, GFF have unique definition in high dimensions? It's probably a simple answer, but- uh, You mean uh, uh, high dimension uh, now uh, that I start changing the, yes. the dimension of the image as well, or? Uh, in general, as you talked uh, in GFF, in two dimensions and in higher dimensions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the definitions I gave, uh, other than the Fourier one, was uh, was a uh, was a general one, right? Uh, um, I mean, the, the characterization works in all dimension, in T two, three, uh, whatever, and also uh, this classical uh, definition as a, a Gaussian process uh, works in works in all the uh, dimensions. Okay, 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe, maybe I misunderstood the question, but uh, yeah, I, uh, for two, I just I, I gave you just a Fourier thing, but otherwise, uh, uh, everything in this characterization works nicely for 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 general, and uh, the, maybe the two-dimensional cases where also the the end ones, level lines, and the exponential, and there uh, um, going outside of uh, two is uh, is something uh, um, is a bit of uh, science fiction still. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I propose that uh, we thank uh, Johan with a big applause. Small one suffices. Thank you. And uh, we okay. will uh, take uh, three minutes uh, to start with Ellen, or maybe, yes, three minutes to say so we can check if everything is okay. Thank you a lot, Johan. Thank you. So, Ellen, can you? Yeah, I will now try to share. Do you see? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Open my notes. So, notebook. So everything is we, we were lucky. Um Christian the Kramata. So yeah, so maybe we can start. Is it? I think it's it's okay. Uh, For me, it's okay. <laughs> yes, perfect. Uh, so welcome again after this uh, short break. Um, <laughs> we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, the second talk of this uh, day uh, that it will be given by Ellen Powell. So she's a professor in uh, the University of Durham. Uh, in, in, in the UK, and uh, she has also been doing uh, amazing work uh, regarding uh, the Gaussian free field, but also branch random work. And uh, she will continue the characterization of the Gaussian free field. Yeah, thank you, Avelio, and thank you, um, Johan, for the nice setup. So now everyone is hopefully very motivated to see the proof of our result. And also I will try and state um, a little bit more precisely um, what the theorem is before uh, getting onto the proof. Okay, so here's just a little reminder. We already saw it in, in the last bit, uh, but the kind of classical definition of the Gaussian free field is a random Schwartz distribution. Um, so that means that it's something that you can test against smooth test functions. So you can also think about it, like Johan was saying, as you know, a Gaussian process uh, indexed by test functions. And then it's defined by um, basically being Gaussian plus two properties, which are uh, what its mean is. So it's going to be a centered Gaussian process, meaning that this has expectation zero for every f and it has a specified covariance structure. So if we test it against two functions, f and g, the covariance um, is given by this double integral of f and g against the green function. And I'll call the green function uh, this, and this is the green function for the Laplacian in, in B with zero boundary conditions. So here I'm talking actually, I should have said about the Gaussian free field in the unit ball, which I'll denote by this bold B um, of D dimensional space. And yeah, just to emphasize that D can actually be anything, um, any dimension um, bigger than or equal to two. Well, any integer dimension bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so I'm going to get onto the theorem in just a second, but I just want to make um, a quick comment about this green function. Um, so explicitly, what is it? So, I mean, one way of uh, defining it is saying it's the green function for the Laplacian, which is some kind of differential equation way of defining it. You can also explicitly um, say what it is as a function of two variables, at least when those variables uh, are not 
the, at the same point. Um, so G is just equal to some constant, depending on your choice of normalization, times some function S, which I'll call S of the distance between Z and W, plus some other function, which I'll call maybe like this. And this function S basically uh, determines how um, this function is going to blow up near the diagonal. So S of um, X is going to be equal to log one over X when D is equal to two and X to the two minus D when D is bigger than two. Okay, so this is something which when X is very small, this gets very big, gets worse and worse as the dimension gets big. Um, and yeah, in the Green's function, which is a function of two variables, Z and W, when Z and W are close, this is very small. So this is getting very big in a way that depends on the dimension. And this function Z, S of Z and W, I've written it like this because this is actually uh, the harmonic extension. So if I think about it as a function of W for fixed Z, this is a harmonic extension of just the function S um, of Z minus the argument um, to the boundary, uh, probably should be minus, well, it's minus the harmonic extension of this function um, to the boundary of the ball. Okay, so this precise definition doesn't really matter, but you know what I want to say is it's equal to this thing which determines how it blows up on the diagonal plus something harmonic. And in fact, um, this means that there's actually a very nice uh, characterization or axiomatic definition of the Green's function, which is probably the one we want to be thinking about in the context of, of this talk. So alternatively, you know, we can give an axiomatic um, definition of the Green's function which is um, the following. So it's gonna be like a little characterization theorem of its own. So if we have a function, if for all Z in the unit ball, K of Z W. So I'm thinking about fixing Z and then asking about a function of another variable in the unit ball. If this is a harmonic function in the unit ball, but not maybe at the point Z. And we know that if we subtract some constant times this function S controlling the blow up, if we know that this thing is bounded in some neighborhood of Z. Okay, so I'm basically saying here, if for every Z in B, we have a function which is harmonic uh, away from um, the point Z and has the right kind of blow up like this function S near to Z, then if we add some other little condition, so if this holds, so this is for some B. If we add some other condition, which is something in some sense saying we have zero boundary conditions, then we can actually say that this function k, so then if I write um, k, z, and w as a function of two variables, if I write this as k, z, if I define this to be k, z, w for each z and w, this is actually going to be equal to b times uh, the Green's function or some constant times the Green's function, you know, for all the points where it's defined. Okay, so maybe it looks a bit technical. The upshot of this is what I'm saying is the Green's function itself satisfies a nice characterization. It's basically the only function which has this blow up like this function S near the diagonal and away from the diagonal is harmonic. Okay, so this is a kind of axiomatic definition of the Green's function. And it's going to be very helpful uh, in the proof. And actually, to see why you have this axiomatic characterization of um, the Green's function, it's quite easy. So it's basically, you know, if I decide to look at the function, if I define f as a function of w, so I'll fix some z in the unit ball, 
if I define f of w just to be equal to the difference between k and b times the Green's function, okay, then this is a function which is harmonic um, because the Green's function is away from the diagonal and also this function is by assumption. Um, this is a function which is harmonic away from the diagonal, but also by assumption, it's bounded, okay? So harmonicity plus being bounded on the diagonal actually, plus the fact that it has zero boundary conditions because we've assumed that for K and it's true for G, this actually means that it has to be the Green's function. And the way you can see that is you can say, okay, well, maybe I look at, for example, F um, of Brownian motion, then this is uh, a local martingale because um, F is harmonic apart from at the point Z. So I can define some stopping times where the Brownian motion gets very close to Z. Um, and, but it's also bounded because this thing is bounded near the point uh, Z. So this is a bounded local martingale. It's actually uh, a martingale. And therefore you can work out its value at a point W by looking at the expectation. So F is F of BT, if B is a Brownian motion, is um, a martingale because it's um, a bounded local martingale and that implies that f of w is just equal to the expectation if I start the Brownian motion from w of f of b um, evaluated when it hits the boundary of the ball and if I have zero boundary conditions this is going to be equal to zero. Okay so if I have you know, if I have a function k which satisfies this, then I can easily show that this difference is equal to zero as a function, and therefore um, k is a multiple of the Green's function. Sorry, what is small b? It is coefficient, arbitrary. Um, b, this, so this characterization is if, it, if this holds for some b, for any b. Uh -huh, okay. Then, then we know that this actually has to be the Green's function. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to um, yeah, bring this up at the beginning because it's gonna be an important uh, part, of, uh, part of the proof or part of part of the proof, okay. All right, so what's our theorem? So Johan already stated it in the kind of way that you should really think about it, that you know, if you have a random Schwartz distribution on the unit ball, so he stated it for balls with the general radius, but I'm just gonna uh, think about having a random Schwartz distribution on the unit ball. If it satisfies this domain Markov property that he explained, plus um, is centered, so that means that you know, if you test H against any function, this should have expectation zero, then basically it has to be um, some multiple of the Gaussian free field. So H is the thing which I've assumed has these properties and HB is my notation for the Gaussian free field on the unit ball. So the theorem says if it has this domain mark property, which remember this is kind of encapsulating a scaling property and um, a spatial Markov property. Um, if this is satisfied, then actually in law, this thing H that we've taken has to be equal to some constant C times times a Gaussian free field um, as defined classically, like on this slide. Okay, so oh, sorry, that was a C? little bit- What is uh, condition C? There exists, there exists a C. Oh, mm -hmm, okay. Then, right, uh, so it, I, it has to be C. some multiple. Uh -huh. Because you know, if I have if I have um, a Gaussian free field and I have ten times a Gaussian free field, they're both going to satisfy these properties. Um, so I can only hope to characterize it up to a constant. So I just um, okay. You see that this isn't entirely complete because this okay. So this theorem is how I'd like you to think about it, but there are a couple of extra um, conditions that we have to add. Um, kind of technical conditions. Actually, one of them is technical and the other one is really necessary, but it's not um, so nice to talk about. Okay, so the first thing I want to add is a technical condition, which we basically assume that our Schwartz distribution is really, is nice enough. So we're gonna assume that actually it has fourth moments, meaning that if you have any uh, test function F, if I test the field against that function F, then this is gonna have finite fourth moment, okay? So this is something which is gonna be very helpful in the proof, but it's not necessary. Um, probably 
uh, you can reduce this to some much weaker condition on the tails of these random variables. But in order to have a nice clean proof, it's, it's very nice to assume this. And in terms of kind of scaling limit results, it seems like this kind of thing is not really um, usually a problem. So, so we keep it there. OK, and then there's a final condition which is really necessary, um, which is going to be, I'll just say, zero boundary conditions. OK, so I really need to assume that in some sense, my field is zero on the boundary of the unit ball. So and I have to you know, explain a little bit what that means, because I have a random Schwartz distribution. It doesn't have values on at points, so it can't, you know, be point-wise zero on the boundary of the unit ball. So I have to um, give this some rigorous meaning. Okay, but if we have, oh, no, I'll explain that just below. If we have um, these three properties, then really um, these do characterize uh, the field. Okay, so let me just remind you quickly what the domain Markov property is. So this A, this domain Markov property, is you know suppose we have some uh, sub ball contained in the unit ball. So suppose we have you know, a ball which has radius R and is centered at some point A, such that this is contained in the unit ball. Okay, so in two dimensions, you know, here's our unit ball and we also have some other sub ball there. Um, then we can actually write, H, we can decompose it as the sum of two things. I'll call it H A R plus phi A R, um, where the two summands are independent. So H A R and phi are independent. Phi is actually a harmonic function when you restrict to this unit, you, when you restrict to this sub ball. So in this picture, phi would be harmonic inside here. And we also asked, like Yuhan was saying, that this HAR is really just a scaled um, and translated copy of the original field. So in here, inside this sub ball, this function H looks like the thing inside the whole ball, but it's translated and scaled uh, in a proper way to be inside there. So um, what I can say is that this has the distribution, the right scaling R to the one minus D over two. So notice that this is uh, one when D is equal to two times the scaled version of H. Um, and H, this HAR is zero outside A, outside this sub ball. Okay, so in this decomposition, phi is actually encapsulating all the information outside and it's harmonic inside. And this scaled copy of the field uh, inside, this is zero outside and yeah, inside it, it's just distributed like a scaled copy of the field. Okay. So that's a reminder about the domain mark of property. So condition B, I think I don't need to say anything more about it. Condition C, I need to just explain a little bit what I mean. Um, so what do I mean by zero boundary conditions? So because we have a Schwartz distribution, we can't you know, declare that it's gonna be zero point-wise on the boundary. Um, so we have to come up with some sensible conditions. So all we can do is test our field against test functions. Um, so we can ask that, you know, if we have some test functions which are becoming supported, you know, near the boundary, then maybe if I test my field against those test functions, um, this should go to zero. This seems like some kind of sensible definition of zero boundary conditions. So, but, you know, I need to ask that these functions aren't too crazy because I could have some functions which are going to the boundary and but are getting huge. And then I might not expect when I test the field against them um, to get something which goes to zero. So the zero boundary condition uh, is going to look like this. So we'll assume that for all sequences Fn of smooth positive functions, whose support is going to the boundary of the unit ball. So let's say the distance between the support of the function Fn and the point zero is going to one. Um, let's ask that 
um, they don't uh, go too crazy. So maybe if I look at the integral, the total integral over the unit ball of the functions Fn, this should be uniformly bounded in n. So this is kind of stopping these guys um, from blowing up in some horrible way. So you know, our boundary condition is going to ask if we have some sequence of functions like this, which are going to whose support is going to the boundary, then we should have that if I test my field H against these functions, this should go to zero. And since I've assumed second moments, let's just say in, in L2. Okay. And therefore also in probability. So this seems like a sensible definition of zero boundary conditions, but in fact, it's actually not enough because the Gaussian free field itself actually doesn't satisfy this boundary condition um, because I can take um, some functions which have total mass one, but are getting kind of supported in some tiny little ball near some very specific point on the boundary. So I also have to add some condition uh, on these FNs that they're somehow sufficiently spread out um, around the boundary. So let me not say exactly what this means because it's not gonna be kind of sufficiently radially symmetric. They don't have to be completely radially symmetric, but sufficiently radiantly uh, symmetric. Okay, but at the level that I'm gonna present the proof, the exact definition of this is, is not so important. Okay, so there is um, the statement of the theorem with all the, with all the um, technicalities now included basically. Okay, so now, um, I want to move on to the proof, but before I do, are, are there any questions about the statement of the theorem? Okay. Right, so let me move on uh, to the proof. So what's going to be the outline of the proof? So there's basically going to be two steps which are almost independent. You can actually probably make them entirely independent of one another. Um, but in the paper, we basically use some things from the first step to make things in the second step easier. But you should really think about these two steps as being independent. Okay, so the first step, you know, in the end, I have my field H, uh, which I can think of, you know, as a stochastic process indexed by test functions, which is linear and um, corresponds to a Schwartz distribution, so has some kind of continuity properties. Um, if I have something and I want to show that it's equal to a gap, if I have a stochastic process and I want to show that it's equal to a specific Gaussian stochastic process, well, then I just need to show that my process is Gaussian and that it has the right mean and covariance structure because that completely determines its law. So that's basically all we have to do. Okay, so there's, um, we've assumed, we've also assumed that our field is centered. So it's part of the assumption that if I test my field against any function, this has expectation zero. So basically we just need to show two things to um, prove the characterization theorem. So we need to show that our assumed field is Gaussian and we need to show that our assumed field has this correct covariance kernel. And I'll write them in the other way around than I just said then, because the first step is actually, you know, the slightly easier step. So we'll show that the covariance kernel, which I'll call K, so this is defined to be, you know, the expectation of our assumed, you know, our taken field H tested against F and our taken field H tested against G. So if I define K like that, the first step is to show that actually K Um, is given by a multiple of integrating against the green function. Okay. And for this, this is the easiest step. And why is this slightly easier? Well, it's because we're just going to use this axiomatic characterization of the Green's function that I tried to explain uh, a couple of slides ago. Okay. And the slightly more involved step, which is why I put this as the second step, is to show that we actually have a Gaussian process. 
Okay, so that is, you know, if I look at what I get when I test my field against any against te smooth test functions, that this is is Gaussian. Is uh, Gaussian. So what does that mean explicitly? It should mean, you know, if I take any linear combination of H tested against things in here, then this should be a Gaussian random variable. Okay, so, you know, IE for all A1 up to AK in R and F1 up to FK smooth test functions, I should have that um, sum AI H tested against FI should uh, be Gaussian. Okay, but in fact, you know, notice that, you know, what is this, if I have these A's and these F's, then what is this sum AI times H FI? Well, that is actually just equal to by linearity of H. Remember, this is meant to be a Schwartz distribution. This is actually just equal to H tested against the sum of AI FI. But this itself, if AI are real numbers and FI are all smooth test function, this is equal to this is also equal to a smooth test function. So actually, it's just enough to show that if I test my field against any smooth test function, then this is Gaussian. So this linearity helps you, you know, reduce this, maybe looks a bit scary thing to actually just showing that if I test my uh, field against any test function, then this should be Gaussian. So it's actually enough to show that H tested against F, capital F now, let's do it, is Gaussian for any uh, test function F. Okay. Okay. Um, so I hope everyone agrees that we can reduce the Gaussianity to, ju to just showing this thing here. Okay. And then these two steps, as I said, these conclude the proof because they show that our field corresponds to a stochastic process, which is Gaussian with the correct mean and covariance structure. So it actually has to be um, a multiple of the Gaussian free field. Okay. And yeah, I said that this step is more involved and the kind of, I guess, philosophy behind this step is that we're actually going to, you know, we're going to decompose the space of test functions into um, basically a decomposition of functions into spherical harmonics times radial functions. And basically by kind of reducing to each, um, reducing to particular functions, we will see that we can reduce the Gaussianity to actually a question um, about characterizing one dimensional processes, something which is in the end going to be related um, to classical characterizations of, of Brownian motion. Okay, uh, but this will make uh, a, a bit more sense in, in a minute, uh, I hope. Okay, so I actually, you know, because I think the second step is maybe conceptually uh, the more interesting one, I don't really want to spend any time on, on the details of step one. I mean, I guess lots of the meat of this is actually contained in this characterization of this simple characterization of the Green's function. Um, but just let me say a few words about step one. Okay. So a kind of useful observation. You know, the first, if we want to show that the covariance kernel is given by, you know, doubly integrating functions against the Green's function, the, the first good thing to show would be that, you know, our covariance kernel can, act, our covariance structure is actually expressed by some covariance kernel. So um, this function K of F and G, you know, I would first, you know, like to say that I can actually write that as the double integral of F and G against some function, which then I would like to show as the Green's function. Okay, and it's actually quite easy to see that you can do this. So the domain Markov property, what it immediately tells you is it immediately allows us to define something that I'll call circle averages of the field.
Okay, and in fact, we'll see that they really are circle averages, although it's not immediate at the moment, because we can apply, you know, if we have some point, and this is going to be a kind of approximation to what the field looks like at a point or, or near a point, right? Because if we look at some ball, so the ball centered at some point Z of radius epsilon, we can apply our domain marker property. So inside that ball, we can write H as a sum of um, something which is a copy of the field inside the ball, but is zero on the boundary of the ball and zero outside the ball, plus something which is uh, harmonic um, inside the ball, right? So if we want to, you know, we want to say, okay, what's the average of this field H on the boundary of this ball, so this circle, um, at least in two dimensions, it would be a circle of radius epsilon about Z, well, it's gonna be the average of this thing on the rate on the boundary of the ball plus the average of this thing on the boundary of the ball right but this thing is zero on the boundary of the ball and outside so really the circle or the average of h on the boundary of this ball is just going to be the average of this harmonic function on the boundary of the ball okay about harmonic functions what do they look like when you take their averages on the boundary of a ball they just like look like the value of the harmonic function at the center of the ball okay so this means you know it's very sensible to define what we could think of as a circle average or kind of a hyperspherical average, which I'll call H epsilon of Z. So this is gonna be like an approximation to the field at the point Z at some kind of scale epsilon. We just define it to be the value of this harmonic function in the domain mark of decomposition inside that ball at the point Z. Okay, and this is a good definition of the circle average. Okay, and in fact, it will follow once we've identified the covariance function that um, the covariance structure that this really is a circle average in the sense that, you know, we could test our field against some approximation to uniform measure on a circle. And as we let that approximation get better and better, we would really get this thing. Okay, but for now, you know, it's just a very good way of um, trying to approximate our field um, at a given point. Okay. So this is, um, yeah, a helpful definition. Okay. And actually, immediately, we get some kind of a priori bounds just by applying the domain mark of decomposition. If I ask, you know, what is the variance of this thing, this circle average? Well, applying the domain mark of property, kind of, if this is my point um, Z here, you know, re repeatedly applying the domain marker property. So basically breaking up this circle average into something with lots of independent and identically distributed sets, I get an a priori bound of the form, you know, this is less than some constant times S of epsilon, where S um, is exactly this function, which is the logarithm in two dimensions and is um, X to the power uh, two minus D and D bigger than two dimensions. So I won't go into the details of this, but this follows from the domain marker property plus our assumed uh, scaling for the field, okay? And what this allows you to do, okay, so one more thing. Also, if I look at, you know, what is the expectation of H epsilon of Z and H epsilon of W, this covariance for two different points Z and W, well, by the domain marker property, you know, when I start taking, as soon as I get to a point a radius epsilon where these two balls don't intersect. So if I had a point Z here and a point W here, you know, as soon as I start taking averages where they don't intersect, um, the way that this changes in epsilon is completely independent for the two things. Okay, so this is actually going to be a function which is constant for all epsilon small enough, depending on Z and W. Okay, so this tells me actually, you know, I can take epsilon as small as I like, and after a certain while, this actually won't start changing, okay? Because, you know, as soon as these balls are, are disjoint, I can then apply the domain marker property inside these balls and um, I will see that this, this, these harmonic functions, um, the way they change is by things which are completely independent 
um, inside each ball. Okay, so this means that this uh, covariance actually won't change as soon as epsilon is small enough. And this is therefore a very good uh, candidate for the covariance kernel, right? So if I define this constant value for all epsilon small enough, let me define that as little k of z and w. <coughs> You know, then actually this fact combined with this a priori bound on how this blows up, um, it's not very hard to see that this covariance kernel, so the covariance kernel of my field can actually be written as a double integral of this function little k tested against f and tested against G, okay? So I guess the upshot is we have a good way of defining the uh, approximations to the value of the field at points. And we actually see that these have a super nice covariance structure coming out of the domain mark of property, okay? And um, it's therefore kind of easy to write the covariance structure of the field in terms of uh, a covariance kernel. And moreover, because of the way that this covariance kernel, little k, is defined, um, it's defined in terms of these, um, it's defined in terms of these harmonic functions. So remember h epsilon of z and h epsilon of w are just given by these harmonic functions evaluated at the point z and w. You see that this, this um, covariance kernel, little k, is actually gonna have some really nice harmonicity properties away from the diagonal. Okay, so this, this actually uh, isn't too hard to prove, you know, and that um, KZW actually satisfies the conditions in the axiomatic characterization of the Green's function. Right. So remember, this is equal to phi uh, z epsilon of z, and this is equal to phi z epsilon of w. Um, so, you know, the fact that this covariance kernel is defined as an expectation of harmonic things, this is what gives you that this little k is actually itself a harmonic function away from the diagonal. Okay. And the fact that it has the right kind of blow up near the diagonal comes uh, basically from, from this kind of a priori bound plus the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, basically. Okay. Because, you know, you know when this, you can actually define this for some fixed epsilon, as long as you take epsilon less than this distance, um, this will be a definition of, of KZW. Okay. So that means that um, the covariance by Cauchy-Schwarz is going to be less than um, S applied to epsilon, where epsilon is equal to the distance between Z and W. Okay, so you get this bound near the diagonal. Okay, so yeah, I'm not going in, into the details of this, but um, yeah, from the, because we can define this little k in such a nice way, uh, it follows that actually this um, k satisfies the conditions in the axiomatic characterization of the Green's function, and therefore. Um, we can say that K has to be a multiple of the Green's function and therefore this covariance kernel is exactly the thing uh, that we want. Okay. Okay, so that's basically, um, I guess the takeaway message from that is that we're gonna use, the, for the first step where we identify the covariance structure, um, we use that we can define circle averages of the field in a nice way. And we also use that the Green's function itself is characterized by kind of very nice, uh, simple properties. So let me move on, on to step two, because I think this is the kind of uh, conceptually interesting thing. So let's start with a warm up. So remember, step two is we want to show that if I test my field against any test function, that this is Gaussian. Okay, so I'm not going to do that straight away, but let me start with this warm up. So let's think in two dimensions because that's um, that's good for drawing. So let's assume that D is equal to two. 
okay and I have this is my unit ball now so it's just a unit disc and I'm going to consider circle averages uh, around the point zero as the radius of the circle decreases okay so I'm going to consider um, the function the process xt which is going to be the circle average which remember I defined this in terms of um, the harmonic functions in the domain mark property, but we can really think about it as a circle average. So yeah, this is the circle average at radius e to the minus t about zero, and that's what I'm going to define xt to be. Okay, so this is now a one dimensional process, and in the end, I'm going to show that it's a Gaussian process. Okay, so by assumption, you know, this thing is just H tested against something. So it has expectation zero. That was an X, my field is centered. Okay, so X is centered. And in fact, um, because of our zero boundary condition assumption, you know, if we, if we let T go to zero, that corresponds to kind of taking averages on the field of the field against things whose support goes to the boundary and are very kind of radially symmetric. Uh, our assumptions also imply that, you know, in L2 or in probability, xt uh, goes to zero um, as t goes to zero. Okay. So now we get on to the interesting thing. So we think, you know, as t goes to infinity, the radii of the circles which are defining xt are going to zero. Okay. What happens if I look at the increments of, of x? So if I look at the difference between xt and xs, well, just by definition, which is the circle average at radius, uh, so let's assume that s is less than t. So the circle of radius s is, is the big, e to the minus s is the bigger one. This is h e to the minus t of zero minus h e to the minus s of zero. Okay, so I can think maybe this is my ball around zero at radius e to the minus s and the one at radius e to the minus t is one of these ones inside. Okay, so this is the circle average of h on the ball of radius e to the minus s, uh, on the ball of radius e to the minus t, okay? But inside, um, the inside this ball of radius e to the minus s, I can apply the domain marker property, right? So I can write the field inside this bigger ball as a sum of two independent things, one of which is a scaled copy of the original field, but inside this ball, and the other one is a harmonic function inside this ball, right? So this is the circle average of, if I write my field in terms of its domain mark of decomposition, of h zero e to the minus s, plus phi zero e to the minus s. So this is just the field part and the harmonic part inside this ball, the bigger ball, uh, at radius e to the minus t. Okay, so what is that gonna be? Well, this field here, uh, Okay, so yeah, maybe it's better first to consider this one. So this guy is a harmonic function inside here, right? And I'm asking for its circle average on some smaller circle. But as we've already used before, if I have a harmonic function, then you know, taking its average on circles, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the radius is, right? Its, it's average is constant um, on circles. So actually, its average on this kind of smaller one is going to be the same as its average on this bigger one, okay? So that actually means that this thing here is equal, this thing here is actually equal to um, the average of this thing on the ball of radius uh, e to the, sorry, the average of this on the ball of radius e to the minus t is equal to its average on the ball of radius e to the minus s, but on this, the average of this on the ball of on the bigger ball is actually just the average of the field H on the bigger ball, right? So this thing I claim is actually equal to XS, okay? 
because inside this in this domain mark of decomposition this guy is zero on the boundary of the bigger ball so the average of the field on the boundary of the bigger ball is the same as the average of this harmonic function here and this harmonic function the average of this on the bigger ball is the same as its average on the smaller ball okay so all of this to say this guy here is equal to xs and this guy here is completely independent of everything that happens outside of this bigger ball. Okay, so it's, and it also, by definition, this is a scaled copy of the field. So when I take its average at radius e to the minus t, if I scale everything by multiplying by e to the s, then um, I see that the distribution of this is actually just equal to the distribution of x t minus s. Okay, so this is independent maybe it's better if i just write the conclusion below so therefore you know i see that xt minus xs is equal to um well basically these things cancel so the average of this guy cancels with this guy so it's equal to the average of this field at radius e to the minus t. And this is you know, independent of everything that happens outside uh, the ball of radius e to the minus s and is equal in distribution to x t minus s. Okay, so what this says is that actually this process x has stationary and independent increments. Okay, so this is very good. Okay, and in fact, we can also use the fourth moment assumption to apply, and this is slightly technical, We can use this to apply a kolman gorov continuity uh, criterion together with some a priori bounds of the same kind of form that we had to use uh, here. Sorry, to sorry. show. Can you say why x yeah. t tends to zero when t tends to zero, why? Because we assume that our field has zero boundary conditions. T so at that to condition, so t tends to zero means the radius tends to one, which means that we're testing, taking the average of our field very close to the boundary. And we've assumed that it has zero boundary conditions. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so with a kind of slightly technical bit of the proof, we can use the fourth moment assumption to show that actually x has an almost surely continuous modification. Okay. And then the conclusion is, well, if we have um, a centered process with stationary and independent increments, um, which also uh, has a continuous modification, we see that X is a multiple of uh, Brownian motion, and in particular, started from zero, in particular, if I look at the process of circle averages as the radius changes, this is a Gaussian process. Okay, so that's very good. We have that something is Gaussian. Okay, of course, it's not quite what we want. We want actually to show that if I test my field against any test function, then it's Gaussian. Okay, um, but actually, and also I was only doing something in two dimensions here. Okay, but in fact, you know, in what I just said, the fact, you know, that I did this parameterization so that the increments of this thing were exactly um, stationary, this is very convenient for like applying a really kind of elegant version of the characterization of uh, Brownian motion. Okay, but um, I didn't really need to do this. So I actually could have parameterized this circle average process uh, in whatever way I wanted. And then it would no longer have um, stationary increments, but it would have independent increments and it would also be continuous. Okay. And in fact, that's enough to show that you have a Gaussian process 
because it basically implies that you have some kind of continuous martingale um, and therefore it has to be a time change of Brownian motion. The independence implies of the increments implies that this time change is actually deterministic, which means that, you know, you have a deterministic time change of a Brownian motion and therefore um, you actually have a jointly Gaussian process. Okay. So, you know, what I'm so saying you, is, I could explain what is H with zero X minus S, X minus T at zero. What does it mean? H with four arguments. This one? H, H, yes, this one. So this is where I've applied the domain mark of decomposition inside this ball. And that the field that comes out of that domain mark of decomposition is this field that's denoted like this. And then I take the circle average of this field on the rate on this smaller circle. That's what this subscript is decomposing is denoting. And this zero is just that I'm taking the average of, of on the circle, which is centered at zero. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what I was just saying um, just before is that, you know, I chose this very convenient time parameterization to have stationary increments, but actually this is really unnecessary. Um, I could choose any to any you know way of parameterizing the radii going from big to small, and I would see that um, I get a process with independent increments, which is continuous, and that's actually enough to show that it's jointly Gaussian. And the reason why I say this is because this actually works uh, in any dimension, right? If I do the same argument now, not just working with circles, but with hyperspherical averages, as I start from the boundary of the ball and move inwards, then I can still use the nice scaling prop, the domain marker property to show that I have independent increments, okay? And I can still do this kind of slightly technical thing to show that I have an almost surely continuous modification. I still start at zero using my boundary conditions. So in fact, I can generalize this proof to show that, you know, in any dimension, if I look at this hyperspherical average process as the radius goes between uh, one and zero, this is a Gaussian uh, process. Okay, and the proof is exactly the same as what I just did. We just don't need to actually use a stronger thing as the stationarity. We really just need to use the independence and the fact that we have these harmonic functions in the domain mark of decomposition. And the important so, sorry, point Ellen, are, just for yeah. the time, you have like five minutes left. Okay, yeah, five minutes I can do. Sorry for, for being slow. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have some kind of Gaussianity, right? We have something that's Gaussian, these kind of averages. So for the general case, you know, recall we actually want, we want that if we take test H against any test function, F. <clears throat> Okay, and for this, we use that actually the space of test functions, uh, which is actually a smaller space than L2B. So we're gonna use a decomposition of L2B. Um, okay, so let me say that, you know, the space of test functions is inside uh, L2 on the unit ball and any F, in L2B can be written <clears throat> as a decomposition in a certain way. So I have to sum over lots of parameters, N, J, and I, sum um, coefficients, depending on the function F, multiplied by some collection of functions Um, like this. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that we have an orthonormal basis of L2B, which is made up of a collection of functions of this form. Okay, and the important point here is that these functions 
um, are radial functions. They depend only on um, the radius uh, or the modulus of the argument, Z. And these things depend only on, um, you know, the projection of the point Z onto the unit ball. And you can choose these such that these things are a spherical harmonics, okay? And these have the key property. They satisfy some harmonicity property. Um, so this function here is harmonic, so don't worry about, about the detail of this, okay? Right, so for example, in D equals two, what this would look like, it would say you can, you know, you have a space of eigenfunctions, uh, you have a space, uh, an orthonormal basis of L2, which is made up of radial functions, multiplied by functions, which are basically on defined, uh, just, they're just a function of the argument of the point, And they look like um, either constant function of the argument or um, sine, n times the argument or cos n times the argument for any n. Okay. So actually what we proved here is um, basically saying, so we proved that if we look at these kind of spherical um, averages, then this is a Gaussian process as we change the radius. Okay. So that actually means, you know, if I tested my field against a function, which was just a function of the radius, right, then I could actually write that as an integral of jointly Gaussian things, which would therefore be Gaussian, okay, so actually rephrasing the lemma says that, you know, if um, there are only terms corresponding to n equals zero, so any, when n is equal to zero, there's only one spherical harmonic, which is just the constant function of um, the argument of z, if you like. So rephrasing the lemma basically says if there are only n equals uh, zero terms, then if I test my function h against f, then this is going to be Gaussian, right? Because if there are only zero terms, that means that F is purely a function of the radius, which means that, you know, I can write uh, H tested against the function by linearity as an integral of circle averages at different radii multiplied by some function of those radii. But if I take an integral of Gaussian things, then this is again Gaussian, okay? So the rest of the proof basically consists consists in generalizing this lemma to testing the field against spherical harmonics uh, on the boundaries of hyperspheres rather than testing them just against uniform measure um, on the boundaries of hyperspheres. Okay, in generalizing lemma <coughs> to testing H against kind of weighted spherical harmonics against, you know, weighted averages on hyperspheres corresponding to these spherical harmonic. Okay, but for that, in fact, the proof is conceptually very similar. Um, we really uh, just use the domain mark of property and this key property of the definition of spherical harmonics here that we have a certain function which is harmonic and so we have a certain kind of constancy um, appearing um, like we get when we take you know if we have harmonic functions then circle averages um, are constant this was kind of the key thing which gave us um, station gave us independent increments in this simple case the fact that this um, property is satisfied means that we'll have a kind of similar uh, constant, um, we'll have something else which is constant as we change radii. And this is gonna allow us to apply basically exactly the same proof to see that if we test H against these kind of spherically harmonic weighted 
um, averages on spheres, we're still going to get something with independent increments. And in the end, we're still going to be able to show that it gives rise to a Gaussian process as we change the radii. OK, and then it's really just a matter of putting this all together and using linearity um, to complete the proof. OK, so I think I'll stop there because I already went over my five minutes and way over time in general. Um, but hopefully this gives you some of the ideas behind the proof. OK, thanks. Thank you a lot, Ellen. Um, so are there any questions before we clap? So, uh, so I kind of start warming up the the, the questions. So, so just uh, I, I I could see one missing part that you didn't tell us because of time, which was uh, essentially okay. You get uh, that for every harmonic, the things are Gaussian, but then you have to sum them yeah. and see that they are Gaussian. What is the technique there? Okay. Yeah. So there's a this is this is kind of interesting. Um, so actually, I can. I can take any kind, I can actually use the same proof to say that as long as I use the right, um, if I look at a certain, if I want, I can take, okay, I can take a weighted average of these kind of spherical harmonic averages. Okay, so I can sum up different spherical harmonic, multiply them by different um, functions. Then I can actually use the same proof for this kind of sum of things to get that this, well, it, as long as the kind of the function of the radius is the right, as long as for the they're related in the correct way for the different harmonics, I don't know if this makes sense. Um, you can basically take a linear combination of these spherical harmonic averages and apply the same proof as long as you like compensate by exactly the right function of the radius. You can show that this again is a, a Gaussian process, okay? Um, so this basically gives you that, you know, if I look, um, it gives you that a certain very special um, radial function multiplied by uh, a weighted sum of spherical harmonics is a Gaussian process. But then you need to change that from having this very special radial function to having an arbitrary radial function. And for that, you need to, you can do it by applying the domain mark of decomposition again. So um, uh. Yeah, it's kind of hard. It's, it's very hard to explain without writing it down, but it, it's like a trick. It's a surprising. The thing you might expect is that you're going to use independence somehow and then say that you can add them up because these things actually will be independent if I test the field against different combinations of these guys. But in fact, we, we don't need to use that. Uh, we can just do some clever trick by taking kind of the right linear combinations and then multiplying them by the right radial functions. And um, okay, then applying uh, applying a little trick, which is somehow surprising, but completely trivial when you see it written down. Thank you. But you're right. This is obviously a, a big part. <laughs> Sorry, can't you explain in the last formula what is i and j are parameters of spherical harmonics? But what is index i? Yeah. So i is also. So I is so for each fixed n j, there will That's also true. be a, a basis of of radial functions. Ah, basis. Um, okay. Yeah, so there'll be lots. There'll be there's lots of indices going on here. So for every fixed n, you can change i and you can change j. So i will actually be indexed by all the natural numbers, and j um, will be in some finite set depend whose size depends on n. So these are, there will be like Bessel functions in the two dimensional case, and they'll be indexed. You'll take um, a Bessel function um, evaluated at some thing depending on i times the modulus of z. And those things depending on i will be the zeros of the Bessel function. So uh, they'll be indexed again, they'll be indexed by the natural numbers. So it is some special basis in radial functions, or what is it? Special basis, but in fact, all we care about is that they're radial. That's is all we care about. Mm, thank you. May I also ask one question? Additionally, 
basically, um, it was a great presentation, but uh, firstly, is this the composition that I think was the basis of your proof of um, uh, which includes the harmonical uh, average and so on, spherical average, is this unique? And is the uh, harmonic average, the spheric or circular average well-defined? Is this related to a moment? I'm not an expert, but is does it always exist? And um, is it well defined? So, right, the fact that we could define these circle averages like really easily without worrying about any kind of like regularity assumptions or anything like that um, came from this domain Markov property. Okay. Um, so, you know, because I have this nice way of decomposing the field inside a ball, I automatically know that I can define, you know, in a very nice way, the spherical average. If you have a general random Schwartz distribution, you don't know if you can define um, the circle average because, you know, that doesn't correspond to testing against a smooth test function. Um, but you can imagine that you know you could replace circle averages with some kind of convolution with a mollifier at scale epsilon. Um, and you could always do that if you have a Schwartz distribution. But just here in our setting, because of our domain Markov property, we can define these things and they have you know very nice harmonicity properties. So they're really the good things to work with. But I don't think they're they're essential. Um, but this is they're, they're just very convenient. This is then moments of the harmonic function, the averages, is it related to the moments of the, of the harmonic function? This is actually- Is, is what related right? to the moments, sorry. But the average, uh, I mean, you take the circle average, is it the first moment or is it related to the moment of the harmonic function? No, or so this, this is really, it's really the harmonic function evaluated at the center, right? So this is a random uh, function, it's really a function Okay. I can evaluate it at the center. So this is random. This isn't an expectation. This is really a random variable. And how I define it is I apply my domain markers decomposition inside this ball. Mm -hmm. I forget about the part which is zero on the boundary. And I just look at the harmonic part and I just take this harmonic function. I just take its value at the center of the ball because that's going to be equal to its average uh, on the boundary of the ball. Okay. Thanks, a little bit more. Clear. So nothing about moments Moments is relevant here, I think. Okay, thanks. So are there any other questions? So if not, I uh, think it's the moment to thank the speakers for the great presentation. With a big applause. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of hands up there, uh, uploading also in the in the. <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Ed, and it was and thank you, Johan. It was uh, uh, really fun, uh, and I think we can stop the the recording on the. Yeah. Yes.